Welcome back to Goldmark TV. I hope you enjoyed our tea bowl exhibition uh, walkthrough last week where we took a look at some of the beautiful chawan that we have here at the gallery. I thought this week, you might have seen during that walkthrough, there were a couple of British potters who were working at making tea bowls that sort of fit the, the tea ceremony context. I'll be looking at two potters today, Mike Dodd, who's based down in Somerset, and Takashi Yasuda on the other side of the world in Jingdezhen, China. I hope you enjoy today. I thought we'd start with the work of uh, Mike Dodd. He's a, a fantastic potter who's uh, shown with us right from the very start. I think his first show was in 2007. And in fact, later this year, in May, we'll be having an exhibition of his work. And that'll be our sixth show, I think, which is quite something. I've actually been working on an, uh, an interview with, with Mike, which will be coming out in our next Spring magazine. And I just wanted to mention something that he'd recently spoken to me about before we get stuck into his work. He called me up about a week after we'd spoken on the phone and he said to me, um, I just wanted to add one thing to our conversation. I want to talk about vulnerability. And he didn't mean his, he meant the vulnerability of clay. And this is what he, he sent me. Clay is extraordinary stuff. Derived from the erosion of mainly igneous rocks, it comes in many forms, having been moved around by water over millennia, gathering impurities on its way and finally becoming a sedimentary deposit in valleys, lakes and river basins. Potters and sculptors alike recognise the lovely quality of plasticity that clay possesses in its workable state. The question arises, how do we do justice to this quality? How do we allow it to show itself? Clay is vulnerable and innocent and will therefore show us the slightest mark when handled. The potter needs to stand back and respectively learn to allow plasticity to show itself, to be mindfully unfussy. The clay is then able to keep its natural plastic quality. One of the ways in which this quality can be enhanced is by the judicious use of slightly runny glazes, which in their runniness gently flow off ridges and out of indentations, intimately reflecting the way the pot has been made. With practice, feeling, and respect, vitality can emerge. Now, vitality is a word that Mike talks about a lot, and uh, you can really see it in his pots, I think. Mike has spent an awful lot of time thinking about form, thinking about how to make pots that have a, a shape and a silhouette that really captures his love of clay, captures what makes clay so special as, as this sort of wonderful, plastic, workable material. He's also particularly well known for having sourced the vast majority of his materials for making clays, slips and glazes from uh, local areas. Now, Mike has been potting since his teens when he started working with Donald Potter at uh, Bryanston School, uh, which he attended, and since then has, has never stopped potting. In the six decades that he's been making pots, he's had as many workshops, uh, which is quite something when you think about the amount of effort it takes to up sticks and move all your equipment and your materials to a new place. He's also worked in places like Peru and given many international workshops. But long in his career, from really quite early on, he's been working to find local materials and you can see that in some of the work that we've got here. I've picked out for us a number of tea bowls. I thought we'd link them to that tea ceremony that talk that we had from last week. Mike doesn't make uh, bowls that he calls uh, Chowan specifically, these aren't bowls that he's made um, with the tea ceremony in mind, but they would certainly fit in that context. And the mixture of bowls that we've got here show off a huge variety of the different local materials that Mike has been working with. In particular, Mike is a fantastic user of ash glazes and we've got some really fantastic examples here. Um, if I pick up a, a lovely uh, tea bowl here, quite new to the website I think, this has got, a, uh, I think, a pair of ash glazes on it. One that's giving this slightly lovely chunning quality here. This sort of blue quality up here that contrasts nicely with this olive along the bottom. All of the ash glazes that Mike uses uh, come from wood that he sourced himself. So it's either ash that's come straight from his fire at home, that's mostly ash tree wood that's been burnt, 
But there's also a number of very interesting ash glazes that he's developed in his repertoire as well. There's a lovely willow ash, which in fact comes from the burnt offcuts from a local uh, cricket bat factory, which I thought was quite a nice story. Ash glazes, as you heard from that little paragraph that, he just, uh, that I just read out from him, are runny and they really show off the form of a pot. They really show off uh, uh, carved decoration, incised decoration like we've got in this bowl. They show off the rims. They kind of accentuate those little uh, points in the pot, those little um, uh, points of departure, uh, the lines between the rim and the base where the wet clay has been allowed to, to form on the wheel. He's worked in places like Cornwall and Cumbria and from those uh, sort of very uh, local context managed to find all sorts of different materials to use in his glazes. Things like granites, andesites, uh, hornfells. We've got a lovely uh, few bowls here that have got ash and granite glazes on them. Here's another pot with lots of faceted decoration, some impressed decoration to again making full use of the very fluid ash glaze which can pool in some of these areas and break away from others. When you're working with uh, sourced materials in the way that Mike does, making sure you've got a consistent supply, talking to people becomes really important so that you can develop consistent glazes. And in fact, when I spoke to Mike, Mike on, the, on the phone a few weeks ago, um, I asked him how many glaze buckets he's got going on at the moment. And he said uh, he actually totted them up that morning. It was a little over 40, 40 glazes that he's working with at the moment. It's quite extraordinary. There were a few little stories that he told me about some of the, the materials that he sourced. So for example, this lovely khaki glaze that we can see on some of these pots up here. This is from a, a Penlee stone, which is um, sourced from a, a quarry between uh, Penzance and Mausel down in Cornwall. And he was told about it by Bill Marshall. Bill Marshall was a, a production thrower who worked with Bernard Leach and became a very, very well established potter in his own right. This stone makes a beautiful khaki on its own. He just takes it from the, the quarry and grinds it down at home. It doesn't change anything to it, doesn't add anything to it, and it makes this beautiful, lovely glaze. In fact, the quarry is decommissioned, so he, when he first went to go and source some of this stone, he had to scale barbed wire fences, uh, go past a trespassers will be shot sign to go and find some of this material. It makes for a lovely glaze, a lovely rich khaki glaze, which I think has really worked on this bowl here with this wax resist decoration. A lot of Mike's decoration sort of draws on the landscape without being sort of too descriptive and too literal. I quite like this, this little design. I'm not quite sure what it's supposed to represent, but it looks to me almost like fish bones maybe, which would be a, a nice link to, to Cornwall again and the fishing industry around there where he's got this, this khaki uh, glaze material from. Lots of materials from, from uh, quarries. We've got a lovely basalt glaze, which has given this tomoku on this bowl here. Again, some faceted de decoration, making the most of this fluid glaze. And an oatmeal glaze on the inside to contrast. And then some other slightly unusual uh, materials. You'll see up here on the front of this bottle, we've got a little flash of blue up here a little bit of added cobalt. This is a material that Mike found when he, was, when he had a studio down in, in Cornwall. And um, uh, he realized that in the sublining tunnels from the tin mines in Cornwall, you could find some of this cobalt in the slag on the, the sides of the tunnels. It was this big, thick, pink crystal in the slag. And he went down there to chip it off uh, one day, not realizing, of course, that it's highly toxic down there, uh, these nauseous fumes. And back then, he, he told me he was a smoker as well. Um, so he might not have come back from, from that particular sourcing journey. We've also got, along with some of these ash glazes, lots of use of, of slips. And one of the things I really like about Mike's work, he's, he uses these quite thick, viscous slips that like to sort of crack and, and, and pull on, on the surface of the pot. These, combined with the very fluid, the very glassy ash glaze, make for really lovely contrasts in decoration. They're really reminders that everything that Mike is working with comes from a living world, from a kind of a, a world that is as important, as vital as we are. 
just one last little bowl I'd like to show you down here. This is a slightly smaller bowl than those that, I've, that we've just had a look at. And maybe it would work quite nicely for a single, a single person's tea ceremony on their own. Just a little quiet ritual for yourself. This has got a lovely peat clay glaze on it, another local material that has been sourced. And I just loved the way that this ash glaze with it as well has pulled down into this sort of striped design, this stepped design around the bottom of this bowl. It's a reminder that in pottery often some of the nicest things can be going on around this base. It's lovely to take a bowl like this and explore it from every angle. There'll be much more to come from Mike Dodd in the coming months. Exhibition in May, so there'll be a, a, an exhibition walkthrough for then, and I'm sure we'll get really stuck into some of these materials. We'll undoubtedly, I'm, I'm sure, have Mike talking about them too. But I thought we'd, we'd just showcase some of his work because it sort of tied in with that tea ceremony, that Chawan exhibition that we had last week. Jingdezhen, where Takashi Yasuda is currently working, could not differ more from Butley in Somerset, where Mike Dodd is at the moment. But uh, Takashi was one of the potters that Mike introduced to his pupils when he was a teacher in Cumbria. And both potters are really drawing on the same philosophy, which is to make the most of clay as this wonderful, wet, plastic material. Takashi, as you can see from the work that we've got here, currently works in Porston, although throughout his career he's worked in a great number of different traditions. In fact, uh, he started out life working at a, a studio in Mashiko, a very famous pottery town in Japan, and it was at 29 that he left that world behind and came to the UK at a very difficult time in potting, really, a time when the kind of tradition that people like Mike Dodd were drawing on, the tradition of pots from Bernard Leach and Shoji Hamada, was really being, being set aside for a new world of quite sculptural ceramics. Takashi also had to contend with being a Japanese potter in the UK and not wanting to exploit that fact, not wanting to make commercial the fact that he was a Japanese person working in the UK. The pots that he's making now are radically different from anything that we just saw from Mike Dodd, uh, but they really get to the heart of why um, clay is such a fantastic material, such a malleable material. Now, I'm going to get a little technical here for the, uh, the fellow layman out there, um, but do bear with me. This is something that I learned from Sebastian Blackie's fantastic essay in our last Takashi Yasuda exhibition from 2019. But there's a reason why Takashi left the UK to then go and work in Jingdezhen in China. Many years ago, in Jiangxi province, there was a mountain that once stood, Gaoling Mountain, from where we get the word Kaolin. This was a mountain that had a huge amount of source porcelain clay in it. And when it was discovered by Chinese potters, they went and excavated the mountain and took their clay downriver to Jingdezhen, which is today the porcelain capital of the world. And in fact, they took so much clay from the mountain that eventually it imploded and it's no longer there. But it made Jingdezhen the place to go if you wanted uh, the kind of blue and white ware that was um, such a craze among uh, European and, and Eastern aristocrats some four or five hundred years ago. There's actually a big difference between porcelain in China and porcelain in the UK, and this is something that I didn't know. You wouldn't think it to look at a beautiful bowl like this, but porcelain is actually quite a coarse clay body. Really, it consists of three main ingredients. The kaolin, the same kaolin that they got from that mountain, silica, in one form or another, and a flux, something like feldspar. Uh, the flux really lowers the melting point of the silica and allows you to uh, get the, the beautiful glaze surfaces that you do in pottery. Silica is responsible for that glassy surface. Now, there's a big difference between UK porcelain and the porcelain in China. The, uh, the coarse body of, of, of porcelain makes it uh, very difficult to work with. It's a primary clay. It's not one that's been dragged by a river or a glacier. It's not been ground down and broken over many years. 
because it's dug straight from the earth and it hasn't been moved, the particles in it haven't been ground down, so they're not so fine. This makes it a very difficult clay to work with. It doesn't have the same plasticity that normal clay does. It also makes it uh, very thixotropic. That's a very fancy word. Imagine you're making a sandcastle with fine, wet sand. Compacted and built up, you can make a lovely castle, but the more that sand is agitated, the more it starts to break down. That's a bit like what porcelain's like. Um, the more you start to agitate it in the throwing, the more floppy it becomes, the more liable to just collapse. Porcelain also has a, a very strange uh, characteristic, uh, pyroplasticity. At the very highest temperatures in the kiln, porcelain starts to behave almost like it was wet clay again, and it becomes very unstable. Managing to make pots like some of these that we can see here, some of these tall vases with this wonderful spiral motion that Takashi makes, uh, is quite extraordinary. The big difference in Chinese porcelain, the porcelain that these potters got from Gaoling Mountain, is that the, the flux in that body is provided by a material called hydromica. Hydromica has particles that are sort of plate-sized, very similar to clay, so they can slide over one another, and that helps the clay become more plastic. It's more easy to manipulate, more easy to, to mould into the various shapes that you want and to throw on the wheel. Now, all of those qualities Takashi knows about, and it's what he's trying to bring about in his work. It's what he's trying to get to the heart of in his work. The beautiful, fluid motion, the fluid lines that you can get in porcelain. One of the things that Takashi has made a point of throughout his career is trying to get beyond the sort of the dogma uh, of a lot of pottery. And he's done that by upending a lot of the techniques that traditional pottery has used. The wheel is supposed to be something very efficient, it's supposed to allow you to make the same pot over and over again very quickly, a production thrower throwing bowls or beakers very quickly. Takashi flips that on his head, he uses the wheel very inefficiently, he sticks his fingers underneath the clay, he um, slows it down by sticking his hand in the middle of a, of a bowl and butting the clay as it, as it comes by. He tries to use the wheel in new ways and simply thinking of it as a tool rather than um, something that has to be used in, a, in one way rather than another. And you can see that in some of the pots here. Something like this fantastic porcelain dish down here with these big indentations here that have been, been made by Takashi's thumb and his knuckles pushing against the clay as it spins around or once it's stopped. I particularly like this work because it's one of the many things that Takashi makes with this beautiful inlaid gold and it casts amazing light patterns all over the walls as you, as you look at it. Another tool that Takashi has uh, used to his own advantage is the, the twisted wire that potters typically use to cut a pot from the wheel once they've finished. If you've ever looked at a pot from the underneath and you've seen where that cut's taken place, you can almost make out the kind of jagged pattern of the, of the wire that's made through the clay as it's separated it from the board. Now, at great risk of damaging his own pots, Takashi has used the wire to facet his own work. You can see that especially on an awesome bowl like this that's been formed in this sort of pentagon shape. You can see here from the sides that Takashi has been cutting into the clay using the twisted wire, and that kind of torqued coil to the wire has created this beautiful series of ridged lines. Now that's quite different from the normal kind of faceting that you would see someone do with a with maybe a, a knife or with a even with a something like a potato peeler. But the pattern that it gets is quite something. And it really makes the most of both the porcelain clay body as this wonderful fluid thing, this soft material but also this lovely glaze that he's chosen, this Qingbai, this blue shadow, almost like a celadon glaze that you see on this lovely porcelain pot. I think it's been over a year since we showcased some of Takashi's work, so it's been lovely to get it out here and to, to show some of you some of the things that, that make it quite special, some of the things that I didn't know about and which uh, Professor Blackie has, has taught me through his, his essay. Do, if you can, pick up a copy of this catalogue. 
It's a fantastic piece of writing. It's a wonderful insight. Lots of things that I didn't know about the world that Takashi has been inhabiting. But do also check out our film, uh, Made in China, the documentary uh, showing Takashi at work. Um, you can find that on our YouTube channel. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating insight into what Jingdezhen has become now, this extraordinary, enormous city producing vast amounts of porcelain in all sorts of shapes. But also what drew Takashi there and what keeps him going, what keeps him interested in clay. It's a beautiful film. I really recommend you, you check it out. I hope you've enjoyed seeing both of our potters today, Mike Dodd and Takashi Yasuda, two completely different potters but working from the same uh, philosophy, the same point of view, to celebrate the fantastic quality of wet clay. I hope you've enjoyed today.